Great. And I think everyone has already, but please make sure your video is turned off and that you're muted um, just to make sure we get the, a good connection. Um, so the seminar will run for around an hour, um, but then after the talk, um, we'll have time for, for questions and discussions. So from around um, 2 p.m., we should finish the seminar, but then there'll be plenty of opportunity for everyone to, to then interact and ask direct questions. Um, this is the third year that we've held this event. Um, and it's wonderful to have so many people on the call today, um, and in particular to have um, Ilana and other members of Ben's family join us. Um, having you here really does make this a, a very special event. And for those of you joining us for the first time, the Centre for Biodiversity and Environment Research here at UCL holds this event annually um, in recogn recognition of, of Ben Collin. So Ben was a, a dear friend and colleague to us here in CEDA, um, and an inspirational conservation biologist um, who very sadly passed away in 2018 at the age of 40. Um, and each year we invite a, a mid-career scientist in biodiversity and conservation to talk about their work, providing an opportunity to remember Ben um, and also to hear about and celebrate the exciting research being done in this field. It's a huge shame that we can't all be together in person today, um, but we are absolutely delighted to have Professor Derek Tittensaw deliver this year's lecture. So Derek is a marine ecologist and holds the Jaroslawski Chair in Marine Ecosystem Forecasting at Dalhousie University in Halifax. And when thinking about how to introduce Derek today, I think what, what makes his work truly inspirational is the vision he has in addressing questions and at a scale that up until that point might not have seemed possible. So for example, his early research provided the first global picture of the distribution of marine biodiversity. And since then, he's worked on a number of projects that have really pushed the boundaries of biodiversity research. From estimating the total number of species on Earth to co-developing the Maddingly Global Ecosystem Model and co-authoring a Princeton monograph along with Boris Worm titled A Theory of Global Biodiversity. And in addition to this fundamental research, his current role in previous position as senior marine biodiversity scientist at UNEP's World Conservation Monitoring Center in Cambridge, Derek has also been very actively involved in conservation science and policy with major contributions to numerous international biodiversity policy processes, including the ITBES Global Assessment, the WWF Living Planet Report, the UN World Ocean Assessment, and among many others. So in short, Derek has made an enormous contribution to understanding the distribution and diversity of life on our blue planet. And it is with great pleasure that I now hand over to Derek. Well, thank you, Alex, for that very uh, generous introduction. And thank you for the um, opportunity to, to give this talk. Um, it's a great honor. Um, and I really, uh, I really appreciate that. I want to start, of course, by um, recognizing Ben. Um, I, uh, I, I didn't know uh, Ben well, um, which, is, which is a regret, of course, um, but we did share a few pints uh, on occasion in the pub at the Zoological Society of London, and he always struck me as a very good-humoured, um, kind, compassionate, thoughtful, um, funny human being, and um, it's... Um, yeah, it's 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 tough, but I, you know, he uh, he really left a mark. He left an indelible mark on on conservation and an indelible mark through all of the um, all of the people that he interacted with, that he trained, and that he um, contributed to in terms of their development. So, um, I'm I'm very honoured and very touched to to um, be able to give this talk to you today. I also want to um, acknowledge Georgina Mace, of course, another another Titan who who um, who was lost to us this year, this past year, um, and Georgina as well is is someone who, um, again, I didn't know extremely well, but um, was part of the UCL community, and um, she always, again, struck me as a, a as a very good humoured and good natured um, person to to work with, as well as a, a great contributor. So. Um, yeah, so we'll move on. Um, so today I want to talk to you um, not about any of my theoretical work, but much more about the applied side of things. So we'll start with just thinking about, about life in the modern ocean. Uh, what, is it, what is it like to be in the ocean in the, in the 20, 
21st century, early years of the 21st century. Well, I recognize that, that many of you uh, probably work on terrestrial systems. So I'm going to start just by discussing briefly some differences, some of the striking differences between marine and terrestrial ecosystems, of which perhaps one of the most obvious is that really it's only the upper waters of the oceans that are sunlit, the upper 200 meters or so. And beneath that, we have this vast um, black um, aphotic zone, which is an enormous volume and um, the largest um, habitat by volume. And we may think of the oceans as kind of one homogeneous whole, but in fact, it's a very diverse set of habitats and diverse range of environments connected together by uh, chemical and, and physical forces. So compared to terrestrial organisms, marine organisms are not limited by water availability, though they have other constraints. So oxygen and getting enough oxygen um, to, their, to their muscles can be a real challenge. At depth, of course, there are extreme temperatures and, and pressures, and there are very, very different strategies uh, in the oceans as compared to terrestrial systems. So for example, reproductive strategies such as broadcast spawning, um, and of course, very different mobility. So there are fundamental differences and perhaps nowhere is this more obvious than in terms of the primary productivity and how that's organized. So on land, of course, estimates vary depending on what you count, but in terms of the, the phytomass, the, the biomass of primary producers, there are about 450 or 500 petagrams standing stock uh, in forests and, and other plants. So a huge amount of biomass and carbon locked up in the standing stock of plants. In the oceans, it's less than a hundredfold of that. So we have one to two petagrams carbon of standing stock of uh, phytoplankton, um, and then some larger macroalgae, uh, kelp, seaweeds, and so on. But the majority of, of um, primary production in the ocean comes from, from phytoplankton. So this enormously different in terms of the structuring of the, of the environment. But what I find particularly interesting and striking is that um, on land, we have maybe uh, 20 petagrams carbon in consumers, in animals um, that are living off the primary production. So it's about uh, 20 fold fewer or 20 fold less biomass in, in consumers. Whereas in the oceans, it's been estimated that there's about six petagrams carbon of standing stock of animals. So actually the standing stock of consumers is, is higher in the oceans than in primary producers. So immediately you have this, uh, if you like, inverted trophic pyramid supported by this really rapid turnover of, of primary productivity um, at, the, at the bottom. But of course we do have, we do have forests in the oceans. We have uh, kelp forests. We have grass meadows, seagrass meadows, but then an enormous variety of marine habitats from those which we're all familiar with, like uh, coral reefs, uh, the open ocean, uh, again, as mentioned, might seem like a, this huge expanse, but is actually incredibly diverse in terms of its um, chemical and, and uh, physical properties. We have the uh, abyssal sediments, which uh, if you just look at the surface of the earth, are the um, largest habitat on earth the deep sea plains. Uh, we have undersea mountains, sea mounts, which can be extraordinarily big and support very biodiverse communities. Uh, we have rocky shores and, and many, many more. There's, there's a huge variety of, of marine habitats. So, so then if we think about the life in those habitats, well, it's been estimated that there are around uh, 2 million or so marine species. So that about a quarter to a fifth of all species are uh, marine. And there are about 240,000, I just looked this up the other day, about 240,000 uh, described species on the World Register of Marine Species at present. So interesting, again, that we have um, maybe a quarter of all species in the oceans, but in fact, most uh, more phyla in the oceans, 34 marine phyla compared to 15 in terrestrial systems. And a remarkable Remarkable diversity of life. Um, 
So we have things like the, the ocean sunfish, which uh, I find quite memorably described on Wikipedia as resembling a fish head with a tail. Uh, it's an enormous fish, can, can weigh up to about 2,000 pounds and loves to come to the surface of the ocean and lie horizontally um, like it's sunning itself. Uh, we have xenophyophores, one of the largest single cellular organisms on Earth, found in, um, a, in the deep abysses at thousands of meters in depth. In uh, 1995, a whole new phylum was, was discovered living on the mouth parts of lobsters, uh, which again is just incredible and goes to show what else is, is out there that we might not know about. Of course, the ocean uh, and the deep ocean in particular has hydrothermal vents, one of the few um, biological communities that isn't supported ultimately by uh, photosynthetic activity and um, energy derived from sunlight. Instead, you have this complex array of organisms um, based on chemosynthesis and, and living off the, the chemosynthetic opportunities afforded by these black smokers and other, other kinds of uh, vents. So you have things like giant tube worms and, and yeti crabs and these whole exotic yet fragile ecosystems. And then we, of course, we have uh, marine mammals, which, uh, which followed the path of um, evolving from organisms that left the ocean and then went back again, and now have uh, incredibly complex cultural lives and um, very um, sophisticated societies. So an enormous variety of, of life in the ocean, but how does it look in the present day? Of course, we know that there are a lot of impacts on, on the global ocean. How are things looking in, in 2021? Well, if we think about fishing effort in terms of bottom trawl fishing, so kind of the fishing that, that drags a large net across the bottom of the ocean, it's about the, the level of fishing is about 3.4 times 10 to the 10 kilowatt sea days uh, at present, which if you're anything like me, uh, is absolutely meaningless. It's a very difficult unit to interpret. So whenever I encounter something that I find difficult to interpret, I try and turn it into something that I can understand. So for me, this process involved thinking about, okay, if I was going to be out in a, in a little Zodiac with an outboard motor, how long would I have to spend on the ocean to, to match the global annual effort in terms of kilowatt sea days of the, um, of the, of the global fleet? And it turns out you'd have to spend about 8 billion days in that zodiac to, to match the level of effort. And this is only in bottom trawl fishing. Of course, there are, there's long line fishing and many other kinds of um, fishing going on. And what we see is that in terms of catches, this is from the FAO, um, catches, which is the orange and red, have, have essentially stagnated. We're seeing about somewhere between 80 and 100 million tons of fish caught annually um, from the oceans. And depending who you believe, that's either flat or declining. But what we also see is the rise of aquaculture. So aquaculture now makes about the same amount, the same contribution in terms of, in terms of um, fish and uh, to, to wild caught fish. So we have again about 80 or 90 million tons coming from aquaculture. So there's a dramatic shift and a dramatic growth. This graph runs from 1950 to, to 2018. There's a dramatic change in the composition of where we're getting our, um, our fish protein and other um, nutrients from. Of course, this, this has all had an impact on the stock status so now we're running from 1974 to 2017. When we look at uh, marine stocks, about one third of them are considered overfished, uh, which is the, the orange. This proportion is still increasing. And these are the stocks that are considered unsustainable, i.e. they're fished at a level at which um, the underlying capital, the underlying biomass is being, is being drawn down and not replenished at, at the same rate. Oops. And then around um, two thirds are, are considered either maximum sustainably fished or, or underfished. So considered sustainable, but of course, uh, MSY, maximum sustainable yield, is a challenging and slippery concept. And what is sustainable one year may not be the next if, if conditions change. 
And these impacts of, of fishing propagate through the ecosystem. So this is just an example. Uh, this comes from, from the late Ransom Myers. And this looked at um, ecosystem change in the, in the Northwest Atlantic off the coast of the United States, the Eastern seaboard of the US. So what we see is that uh, large sharks such as the, the bull shark here um, have all showed substantial declines primarily from overfishing uh, or caught as bycatch of around 90 to, to 99% very consistent pattern. What that has done is that has enabled the um, predation release on, on mesopredators such as the, as the cow nose ray and a lot of these rays as they uh, move up and down the, the coast of the United States like to feed on uh, mussels and, and scallops. And this caused essentially the closure of a, of a hundred year old fishery as these mesopredators increased and their predation on the scallops uh, therefore increased and the scallops of course then um, were extremely challenged and um, the fishery was forced to close off North Carolina. So we're seeing these, these trophic cascades uh, driven by things like overfishing uh, that, are, that are playing out. And we're feeling the impacts on human benefits uh, derived from the ocean. So, and it's really, I'd need, I'd need 50, you know, 50, 55 minutes just on this, just to cover essentially the range of impacts uh, on the ocean in the present day. But, but things I won't really talk about are uh, destructive exploitation like dynamite fishing, uh, pollution, we've all heard a lot recently about plastic pollution, but there are, there's noise pollution on, uh, that affects uh, marine mammals in particular and their um, communication. Light pollution that can affect um, turtles and their uh, juvenile turtles and their orientation when they hatch. We have invasive species, we have hypoxia. Uh, the image at the top is um, some debris and rubbish collected from um, a deep ocean trench. So our pollution is essentially reaching the most remote parts of the ocean. However, these are all solvable problems. These are all things that, that can be addressed and can be tackled. They are abatable threats. And some of them are showing improvements. So for example, the US um, has shown substantial improvements in the management of, of many of its stocks and should be recognized for this. It's, it's, it's done a, a very good job of uh, ensuring that many of its stocks recover. There's also a growing awareness of our impacts of, on the ocean. And this is really heartening to see. There's been a lot of um, public interest and of course some, some major films recently about human impacts on the ocean. Yet, we're still haunted by one impact that is less solvable, certainly at present. And that, of course, is climate change. And the effects of climate change are already being felt. So let me give you an example. This is a, is a hypothesis, but it's a, a very... Um, strong hypothesis, and I would say it's, it's backed, by, backed by data. So the North Atlantic right whale is one of the most endangered marine mammals on the planet with um, a population numbering in the hundreds. It's very vulnerable to mortality from a range of human impacts, but particularly ship strikes and entanglements in, in fishing gear. So the zooplankton species, Calanus finmarchicus, on which the North Atlantic right whale feeds has been shifting its range recently due to ocean warming. And the North Atlantic right whale appears to be tracking this and has started appearing in new parts of the ocean, uh, uh, including in places such as off Nova Scotia, where I am now. It's, it's more common in the Bay of Fundy here. And this has brought it into contact with more fishing gear and across more shipping lanes. And it has seen an increased vulnerability to, to ship strikes and this, of course, is, is potentially catastrophic for such an endangered species with just a, a handful of new individuals born every year. And again, to their credit, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans has induced um, very stringent regulations on, on vessel speed. But we can imagine this as, as if you like, an um, example of the kinds of chaos that we can anticipate more of 
as the ocean warms and as things change. So I want to, I want to have, a, have a thought experiment. I want to focus on, on climate change in this lecture and think about what does the future look like for the ocean? But let's imagine that we solved all of the ocean's issues. Everything's done. We've, we've dealt with overfishing. We've reined in our plastic pollution. Um, we've dealt with all of those challenges that I, that I went through at the start, at least to some manageable extent. So that the ocean is, is now on a um, sustainable base, except for climate change. We haven't dealt with climate change. And how will the oceans, how will the oceans look? Well, to address this, I thought I'd, I'd send you a postcard from, from the future ocean. So from the end of this century, 2099, uh, it's really hot. The oceans have warmed up a lot. We, we have basically tracked the scenario RCP 8.5, which is the high emissions scenario. So we haven't done a good job of reining in our emissions and the land and the oceans have warmed substantially. How does it look? Well, coral reefs are, are in major, major trouble. So uh, in 2100, we are seeing annual bleaching uh, for 99% of the world's coral reefs. Bleaching, of course, is when the corals uh, undergo things like heat stress and expel their uh, symbiotic zooxanthellae and lose their characteristic color, uh, become these white skeletons and are at a high risk of, of mortality. So basically all coral reefs are, are bleached. And in fact, they look nothing like they did in, in 2021. They're really a, a, a composition of, of macroalgae. The algae have taken over and have, have kind of pushed reefs to the fringes. Of course, it's not just ocean warming that affects coral reefs. It's uh, ocean acidification as well. So it's more challenging for them to build their uh, skeletons. And we often think about ocean acidification. So the uptake of CO2 by the oceans and the um, diminished availability of the, of the carbonate ions that um, calcifying organisms need to build their skeletons. We often think of this as, as primarily affecting coral reefs, but, but that's not true. This affects all calcifying organisms. Um, so, so mollusks, uh, pteropods, uh, some plankton, coccolithophores, for example, will all be affected by ocean acidification. And then we're seeing other impacts. So changes in the ocean circulation and um, increased warming of the ocean have caused this expansion of hypoxic zones. So these areas where the oxygen level has really diminished to a point that makes it challenging for many species to exist. So these, these areas of the ocean have expanded both vertically and horizontally. And for example, they may push some, or they've pushed some fish species out of those regions into the upper waters and more into contact with, um, with fishing gear. And of course, there are, there are numerous other implications like um, changes in, in nutrient regimes, circulation, changes in disease transmission. But I want to focus really on the effects of, of warming and the, the effects that warming has had on the global ocean. And often when we think of, of warming and when we think of conservation biologists and ecologists of the effects of uh, changing conditions, we think about that in terms of species range shifts. So for example, the sheep's heads in, in 2100 uh, is no longer found in, in the Gulf of Mexico. So in these maps, um, the blue is, the, is the, essentially the predicted habitat suitability with darker blue indicating more suitable habitat. So you can see that this uh, sheep's head has been pretty much extirpated from the Gulf of Mexico and pushed up the, the coast of, of Florida and pushed northwards. There are, there are thousands of examples of this. And when we look at the, at the pattern as a whole, what we see, um, and this, is, this has been demonstrated in uh, multiple studies, essentially is a decrease in species richness at the equator, maybe by uh, a thousand species or so um, of those that we've, that we've modeled and that we've looked at. Of course, there are many species that haven't been modeled in this way. And then a, a, 
a pushing of those species away from equatorial and subtropical regions and more towards temperate and polar waters. And we may see an increase in, in temperate regions as shown in the, in the top map, and maybe even an extraordinary increase in species in, in polar regions where the um, ice caps essentially have, uh, or in the Arctic, where the, the ice caps have essentially melted on a seasonal basis. We get these new blooms in productivity and whole uh, new communities have moved in there and new fishing grounds have, have opened up. And of course, there's been a big geopolitical struggle over that. Um, so these maps essentially where, where blue is, is low richness and, and red is higher richness show this kind of consistent pattern, what you might expect um, species um, redistributing across the global ocean. So I want, to, I want to talk about two other impacts of warming that we, that we don't necessarily or haven't necessarily uh, considered in great detail. And in fact, we've only really looked at in the last couple of years. And I'm gonna concentrate on these in part because they, um, they look at ecosystem dynamics and the changes in ecosystems that come from the assembly and, and re, uh, reassembly of, of individuals in ecosystems. So when we think about climate change, as I said, often we think about species moving and we think about species distribution models or habitat suitability models. So you have a range of species occurrences, you have a range of environmental variables, and then you model the species uh, niche, its, its fundamental niche, and then you look at its projected future distribution based on projections of the future environment. So this is how we often consider thermal impacts on the ocean. But we're finding that there are, there are other, new, other impacts. It's like, it's like the internet. We have this kind of the, the, the first order impact is improved communication across the world. But then there are these second or third order impacts that we're, that we're just discovering, right? States are now using uh, Twitter as a, as a weaponized tool to try and influence elections for, for other states. So we have these unforeseen consequences. And it's the same with, with climate change in the oceans. And I'm sure there are many other consequences that we haven't looked at. But in general, we concentrate on rain shifts. But let's start to look at some of these other impacts. So the hypothesis here is that we need better marine ecosystem projections. And here we are unashamedly uh, learning from what the climate modeling community has done. What the climate modeling community has done has developed this range of earth system models and then brought them together in ensembles. So we have ensemble modeling of, of earth system models to give essentially a spread of, of uncertainty about our future projections. So here we have um, the trend line under RCP 8.5 in, in red. And then the shaded red area is the, um, is the uh, essentially the intermodal spread. So it gives you some sense of how much the models are agreeing or disagreeing about the, the change at the end of the century in 2100 uh, in terms of the climate. And in blue, we have the RCP 2.6 scenario, which I'll be getting to a little bit later. So ensemble modeling gives you, gives you the benefit of not just, not just one projection, not just one mean projection. So here, the mean is that in 2100, we'll have an increase of around four degrees in terms of global surface temperature. But the spreads projected by these models ranges from about three to about uh, five and a half degrees. So it gives us some sense of the range of uncertainty that we have. And I think it's a really great approach and one that we um, are trying to adopt. However, there's a, there's a challenge here in that the earth system models developed by uh, climate scientists, physicists, atmospheric scientists um, are based on a common understanding about the way the world's climate works and is organized. So essentially there are these consensus ideas about, you know, for example, solar radiation coming in, being trapped by the clouds, warming the earth, the role of the carbon cycle, the role of the oceans in terms of um, carbon sequestration. So we have a, a common basis and not just a common conceptual basis, 
a common theoretical basis, i.e. the, the Navier-Stokes equations of, of fluid dynamics. So essentially, uh, in 1955 or so, Norman Phillips developed a, a, a climate model, the first climate model, and every Earth system model since then follows on from this common progenitor. So essentially, in a, uh, in a biological context, what we have is a, is a monophyletic uh, phylogenetic tree of Earth system models. Now, this isn't the actual phylogeny, but you can imagine that there's this common source, this common conceptual basis. And this agreement is both, well, it's, we have a better sense of the, we have a better understanding of the fundamentals of the, of the climate system. And so this range of models, which interpret this somewhat differently, uh, gives us a, a spread, if you like, of the uncertainty that we have. Ecosystems are far, far different. Marine ecosystem models are almost comically uh, different from one another in terms of how they interpret the oceans and how they interpret what's important for marine ecosystems. They have no common theoretical basis. Uh, they can be quite complex. This is a um, schematic of the eco-ocean model, which includes things like um, uh, marine protected areas. It has environmental preferences. So it has a, a niche model in there, but it also has metabolic impacts. Uh, it has a, a fishing gravity model. It has food webs. So it has um, kind of a, a mass balance equation in terms of how the different components of the food web are structured. Uh, so there are, and this is one example, but we have an extraordinary range of marine ecosystem models. So just to give you an idea, some of them are based around the um, idea that, that species are the fundamental unit. Some are based around the idea that species identity is uh, not irrelevant, but that size is a more important factor in terms of structuring ecosystems. So they group things by size. Some group um, organisms based on their functioning within an ecosystem. Some of these models explicitly incorporate dispersal. Some of them don't incorporate dispersal. The range of taxonomic groups covered is, is wildly different. So they may or may not include marine mammals. They may or may not include uh, non-commercial species. They may or may not include in, invertebrates. Um, and they may include um, metabolic impacts. They may not include metabolic impacts, um, predation interactions. So all of these things are wildly different. So if you like, we have a, 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 a kind of a, a, a case of non-convergent evolution where we have a set of almost independently um, evolving marine ecosystem models, uh, including pure species distribution models, pure trophodynamic models, composite models. We have an extraordinary range. And this, this unfortunately makes it challenging to compare them. It's great in terms of um, trying to understand what's important in terms of climate change and its impacts on the ocean, because it, it really allows you to have a real much, much broader um, projection uncertainty because you have so much uncertainty in the structure of the models themselves. So to try and tackle some of this, we, we uh, my colleagues and I set up the Fisheries and Marine Ecosystem Model Intercomparison Project or, or FishMIP. And FishMIP essentially tried to derive a standardized protocol for sitting a range of marine ecosystem models at the top here in red, which model things essentially generally things from small consumers, um, potentially zooplankton or, or the level above zooplankton to medium consumers such as uh, fishes uh, and invertebrates, some invertebrates, and then these large consumers like um, sharks and marine mammals, and also uh, in some cases sit fisheries on top of that. And then these are all forced by earth system models. So earth system model projections, which, which include um, the biogeochemistry of the oceans and generally different classes of phytoplankton and zooplankton, which are then fed into the marine ecosystem models and allow us to try and make projections of, of marine ecosystems. So at present, we have about nine global models and about again, very diverse range of models and about 10 or, or more regional models of marine ecosystems. And the regional models are entirely different from, from the global models. We use two earth system models to 
uh, GFDL and IPSL to force the marine ecosystem models to enable us to make projections about what's going to happen to, to marine ecosystems. And we use four climate scenarios from RCP 2.6 to, to RCP 8.5. And again, I'll be focusing on RCP 8.5 at present. And there's a focus because these models are so uh, diverse, it's difficult. You can't standardize and say, okay, what's, what's gonna to happen to this individual species? Because some models don't include species. So what we essentially focus on is, is biomass change. So the, the total biomass in marine ecosystems of all consumers. And we also look at how size structure in the ocean changes. So how does it look? Well, these projections that I'm going to show you are all from pure climate signals. So this is without fishing sitting on top. So we've isolated what's going on in climate. And what we see essentially in terms of interpreting this graph is that we have a reference period between 1990 and 2000. That's the uh, vertical gray shaded area, which we set to be zero. So that's no change in biomass. And then the black line is the historical periods. Again, the, the line is the multimodal mean and the shaded area is the, is the, is the uh, uncertainty around that. And what we see is that we have a, a decline and this is total global uh, marine ecosystem consumer biomass. So the amount of stuff in the ocean that we have, and that for example, supports all of our fisheries and all of these other ecosystem benefits that we get. And what we see under RCP 8.5 is that we get a steady decline uh, in terms of the overall biomass in the ocean, such that by 2100, we have about 15% less biomass in the ocean. And there's a fairly wide range of uncertainty around that, but still these uncertainty bounds are trending in the same direction. We have essentially a substantial decline in the total animal biomass in the oceans, which is, which is quite worrying. And in fact, we can map this to... Um, to degree change. And what we see is that for about every one degree change in, in the Earth's temperature, we lose about 5% of the, of the stuff in the ocean. If we look at that spatially, what's happening is that we are essentially losing uh, a lot of material in the tropical and subtropical and, and parts of the temperate oceans. So here red is a, is a decline up to around 50% decline in terms of biomass. Again, this is the ensemble mean. But then in, in polar regions and, and subpolar regions, we're seeing uh, potentially huge increases in, in, in biomass. Again, likely driven by things like the melting of the sea ice and this whole new um, areas opened up for, for increased productivity. Sitting on top of that, we have um, what, I, what we've characterized as trophic amplification. So these declines in biomass, if we look at it going from primary productivity, so we have a decline in primary product productivity under RCP 8.5 on the right of about 3%. We have a decline in, in phytoplankton biomass of around 5%. But then as we move up the food web, we're starting to see a decline in, in zooplankton of around uh, 12% then of higher trophic levels of about 16%. Now there's a, a broad range of uncertainty on those, but essentially what we're seeing is we're seeing these biomass declines propagate up the food web and impact things at the top of the food web more severely. So why is that? Well, it's likely what's going on is, is that increasing temperature um, causes things like changes in metabolic costs. It makes it metabolic more, metabolically more expensive to grow. Um, it can affect things like um, maturation age and um, maximum size. And in fact, there's good empirical evidence on this. Uh, we, ha we have complex changes in productivity that can, that can, affect, um, uh, can affect size structure. And we have these changes in, in trophic interactions. So in fact, a um, empirical study came out just this year that said that um, trophic transfer efficiency, which is how efficient uh, the food web is, is at moving things up from one trophic level to the other, uh, trophic transfer efficiency uh, declines as water warms. So essentially we're seeing 
greater inefficiency as you move up the food web. And we're seeing this both empirically and in these model projections. This next thing that I'm gonna talk about is, um, I'd say is more of a hypothesis right now, but again, I'm just pointing it out because it's something that we didn't think about until we, until we looked for it. And it's to do with behavior. So it's an interesting example of behavior and individual level effects potentially propagating up to the global level. So what, what we hypothesized here is that there's a performance difference between endotherms and ectotherms in the ocean. So essentially at, at low ambient temperatures, so on the left-hand side of this graph, ectotherms are more sluggish. They move more slowly, the water's cooler, um, and they're outcompeted substantially by endotherms. So the thermal performance of, well, the performance of, metabolic performance of, of endotherms of marine mammals uh, is essentially independent of water temperature. So in cold water, they have a strong competitive advantage and if necessary, an advantage in terms of avoiding predators relative to ectotherms. And that delta, that performance difference narrows as the water warms. So in warmer waters, there's less of a performance difference. And this is linked to, to differences in thermal physiology and when compiling information on, on the performance of ectotherms, they, they absolutely um, fit this hypothesized um, uh, relationship. So we looked at things like burst speed, which is the maximum attainable speed, um, the firing rates of neurons in the brain, flicker rates of, of, uh, of eyes, of vision, of search radius. And these all um, change and decline for for fish in, in cooler water. So there's essentially a, a near linear relationship between the maximum burst speed of fish and water temperature. So when things are, are warmer, these fish move faster. Whereas for, um, for endotherms, it's more of a flat relationship across temperature. So there are, there are competitive implications for marine species here, right? In the cold waters, ectotherms are sluggish and they are easier to catch for endothermic um, predators. It's also easier to avoid more sluggish predatory sharks. So we derived this uh, metabolic model of interactions. And I, I'm absolutely not going to go through this right now, but essentially a, a model of, of how encounter rates and, and capture rates and these interactions between endotherms and ectotherms would affect the total consumption rate uh, attributed to marine mammals in the global ocean. And then we looked at uh, data um, to see how, how this relationship actually played out. And indeed, the, so these are, these are modeled estimates, but um, these are estimates of the total consumption of uh, marine mammals with temperature. And each of these dots is a, is a grid cell in the, in the global ocean. So it's a, it's a 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer uh, grid cell. And what we see is that the, the consumption declines quite substantially as the water warms. So essentially in cooler waters, marine mammals are appropriating a much larger chunk of primary productivity and are supported by a larger chunk of primary productivity than in the tropics. And if we normalize this by primary production, what we see is that there's about an 80-fold decrease in the um, portion of primary production that flows through marine mammals. Okay, so a much larger portion of primary productivity is flowing through the marine mammal part of the food web in, in temperate and polar waters and a much smaller proportion in tropical waters. So what are the implications of climate change on this? Well, again, I think this is still very much a a hypothesis, but we might expect that as the water warms, marine mammals will be um, disproportionately penalized uh, in terms of their competitive advantage. And we might start to see even smaller fractions of um, material flow through uh, endotherms in the, in the food web. So this has been, whoops, this has been relentlessly um, depressing 
if you if you look at it as purely the the climate impacts but i don't want to focus on that okay so we have this this postcard under rcp 8.5 that shows an extraordinarily changed global ocean and again these are just climate change impacts this is without all of the other stuff sitting on top but what can we actually do about this so so here's another postcard so this postcard is from 2099 still and it's it's warmed up a bit but we're coping a bit better we've done much better in terms of mitigation we've capped our emissions and we've actually followed pretty much perfectly the RCP 2.6 scenario, which is much lower emissions, much lower uh, level of warming in the global oceans. What we see is that, again, on our graph of, of changing biomass, that mitigation has had a huge impact. So by 2100, now we're looking at the blue line, which is RCP 2.6, we're seeing about a 5% decline in global ocean biomass. That's still quite a lot when you think about it. That's a, that's a huge chunk of, of global biomass that's, that's essentially um, being respired and, and disappearing off, but it's more manageable in terms of its impacts on human society. And it's certainly better than the impacts under RCP 8.5. So we're seeing a real, um, benefit from mitigation there. Under FishMIP, we've also looked at consequences for individual countries and the benefits of mitigation. And what we see essentially, and this, this graph shows essentially the, the benefit of mitigation versus non-mitigation. And the way to read it is that uh, anything above the diagonal line, above and to the left of the diagonal line, is a benefit from mitigation. Anything below the diagonal line is essentially a situation where that country is actually better off under a high warming scenario. So what we find is that almost every country benefits from mitigation in terms of the, the biomass change in their exclusive economic zone. Almost every country. There are a few where it's actually better if the, if the world warms further, but almost everywhere, again, benefits. And the other thing that I haven't talked about is marine protected areas and um, building some resilience to climate. So this is where a lot of the focus of my own research is at present. And we looked at this and we thought about how to um, build resilience to climate change in marine protected areas. And we came up with a set of eight recommendations that you see on the, on the right of your screen. And these can be as simple as, you know, just creating a, a, a catalog that documents the types of climate change adaptation that you can have in marine protected areas, having a target for, for including climate change into MPA management plans, but also as complex as maybe thinking about more dynamic um, multi-sectoral tools. So is there such a thing as dynamic marine protected areas? Well, there certainly isn't a present. Is it something that's a possibility? I mean, that's up to us. We, we, we need to think about the, the pros and the cons, but we should certainly explore more dynamic management tools. And the oceans may be a good place to do this. And what we, what we think about is we think about having a protected seascape, okay? So we don't just have marine protected areas. We have all kinds of policy tools. We have fishery closures. We have uh, marine spatial planning. And so we do have traditional marine protected areas, which will be impacted by climate change, but we can try and build some resilience into MPAs and then also buffer them with these more dynamic features that can be turned on and off to protect things like migratory routes and to um, deal with shorter term uh, changes. So we still have time just about to choose the ocean's future. But for the last few minutes, I wanna take a, <laughs> a bit of a left turn here and think about how we actually perceive the future. Right? How do we think about the future? Well, 
in terms of science and in terms of all our projections, I've been talking a lot about RCPs and their companions, their shared socioeconomic pathways, essentially describe the future. They are narrative pathways, things like taking the green road. It's a, it's a description about how the world changes. And these SSPs are what we use to, to model the future. Essentially, there are these range of plausible futures um, that um, affect all of our modeling and conservation. And they affect how we think about the world. They affect how the range of futures that we are prepared to consider from more sustainable to less sustainable. But really the range of ways that we think about the future affects the possibilities that we think may happen. So an example of this is, is geoengineering. A nice quote from uh, China Meeble, and I think he was um, quoting Andreas Mahm here, um, which really, if you like, strikes at the absurdity of this, all right? So he says, a similar shift is, is visible in the rise of geoengineering. It's easier to imagine the deliberate transformation of the entire planet than it is to imagine transforming our political economy, which is absurd when you think about it. And even in, in, in recent papers, and I, I wanna emphasize here, these are authors that I really respect. This is, this is a really um, prominent group of people doing good things and thinking about how to address climate change when it comes to coral reefs and what are the solutions. And they talk about societal adaptation and there's a whole range of geoengineering concerns in there, but nowhere is there anything about radical societal transformation, reconfiguring our society in terms of capital as the basis of, of our society and as ultimately the problem. They're talking about changing the surface of the planet at large scales, but again, not, not really transforming our whole basis of, of society. And, and we can think about this and we can argue about this, but certainly others have noted that we can, we can have capital, we can have the accumulation of capital, we can also have ecological integrity, but we can't have them both together. Is that true? I don't know. I think we need to, I think we need to debate this, but I think it's certainly a possibility. I'm sure many of you and all of us are working towards a more positive future and are doing really integral things. But again, we're working within this systemic framework that is challenging all of the work that we do. And the systemic framework is that we're trying to find ways to fit nature into our economy. So we keep doing these, these things in purely economic terms. So let's think about these economic terms. So we have a value of, of pollination services that's you know, roughly $170 billion, which is an extraordinary amount. We think about, in a marine context, fisheries may be providing employment for 60 million people. Again, hugely, hugely important. And, and both of these, of course, hugely impacted by climate change. And the total estimated economic value of all ecosystem services has been put at, of course, there are a range of estimates, but in 2014, Costanza et al. estimated it at about... $125 trillion per annum, which seems absolutely extraordinary. But let's compare that. Let's compare that to the market cap of Apple, okay, the most valuable company on the planet. The total value of all ecosystem services, which underpin all life on Earth, is akin to about 60 apples. And I'll let you draw your own conclusions about this, this ratio in terms of how we value nature to how we value um, Apple and, and its market cap. But we keep trying to find ways to fit nature into our economy. Um, I think we're doing it the wrong way around. We need to find ways to fit our economy into nature. I'm almost done, I promise. Um, the other thing I just wanna hit on is that climate and inequality are inseparable. So if we look at the, the world average, um, and I don't expect you to read this, but the world average kind of um, CO2 equivalent emissions per year is about 6.2 tons per person. And it's really shocking to see the disparity. So in terms of countries that have the, 
the lowest CO2 equivalent emissions, Honduras, we're looking at about 0.09 CO2 equivalent. In terms of the highest global CO2 emissions, we have about 318 tons CO2 equivalent emissions. So we have an extraordinary disparity in terms of climate emissions. And when we think about climate change in the oceans, we have to look at this. Climate and inequality are inseparable. So I plotted the income percentile. This is a nice new data source. So this is, this is looking across the global population and the income, where they sit, where uh, individuals sit in terms of their income from on the left, the lowest income, to on the right, the highest income, and their proportional contribution to the global cumulative emissions. It's not linear. There's no linear relationship there. It's exponential. And this really is kind of, to me, again, strikes home at the heart of inequality, right? Global CO2 emissions. If we took the top 10% of earners and not even, you know, not even decreased it by a lot, but just decreased their emissions to make them, oops, sorry, excuse me, equivalent to the 90th percentile, then immediately we'd save about 25% in terms of the global cumulative emissions. Remarkable. Um, and again, coming back to this, we see this relationship in terms of marine ecosystem benefits and, and climate change and inequality. If we look at the human development index, then countries which are lower on the human development index on the left hand side stand to benefit much more from mitigation than countries which are wealthier. So I'm just going to come back tie that all together, how does, this, how does the future look for the global ocean? Well, I just wanna say that in some cases, I think we're like a horse with, with blinkers in that we only see what's ahead of us. We see the range of scenarios and the range of opportunities presented to us by the RCPs and the SSPs. And maybe we need to think about a model, much more radical scenarios. And there is actually the IPES, um, assessment of transformative change coming up in the next few years. And I really hope that that will include scenarios that involve not just transforming the surface of the earth or geoengineering, but transforming society as well. So that when we think about the future of the oceans, we think about it not just for us, but for her and for, for him, because everyone's affected by the oceans, for him. And, you know, for me, it's, it's personal as well. It's my daughter. And how is she how is the future of the ocean going to look for her? Um, I just want to acknowledge Alex and, and Amy and the organizers and everyone for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Um, and I, I want to thank the Yaroslavsky Foundation in particular for, again, affording me the, the opportunity to explore some of these questions and Hempel and NSERC. And if I was to list all of my amazing colleagues and, and students and, and friends and discussions, it would be too long. So these are, these are just the people who I've been kind of throwing some of these ideas about with more, more recently. And I'd like to thank you all for, for your attention and, and leave you with a, with a picture of Ben. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek. Um, I know there's lots of claps and, and raised thumbs um, thanking you for, for a really wonderful talk and um, really nice to hear your, your ideas, not only of kind of the, some, in some cases, rather depressing challenges, but also a kind of more upbeat, inspirational vision for how we could steer the oceans, but also human society to a better place over the next few decades. Um, so we've got time for, for questions and, and discussion. Now, of course, if anyone needs to, to drop off the call, then, then please do. Um, but yeah, we're scheduled until 2.30 if, if we need it. Um, so I'd like to invite anyone now who has any questions to Derek or, or just for a more general open discussion. Um, we can use the chat, so please feel free to write any comments in the chat. Otherwise, um, please raise your hand um, and I will, I'll try and fee field your questions. Um, I guess while we're waiting for, for some questions to come in, maybe I can just get us started. So I, I was just wondering, Derek, kind of, how do you feel the perceptions of the ocean have changed over the decades in terms of how 
how we view the ocean and how it can respond and cope with with the stresses and, and, and impacts that we're throwing at it. I think it's I think I think it's impossible to avoid talking about sea spiracy here, isn't it? Because I think in terms of our perception of the oceans, a lot of it has been shaped by things like Blue Planet and other documentaries, and then more recently, Sea Spiracy and these these uh, newer wave of documentaries that are much more pushing at the seams of the challenges as well as the variety of life in the oceans and all of the awareness. And this is a really positive sign. I think our awareness of the challenges faced by the oceans and ocean ecosystems have grown dramatically. And that to me is perhaps the most positive thing in the last decade is the growth of, of public awareness from if you like this, this vast blue expanse to a really complex um, and threatened ecosystem and that, that people really engage with it, I think in a, in a different way than they would have done 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so John, you have a question. Yeah, hi Derek, uh, thanks very much for that. Um, uh, particularly for what you said towards the last five minutes, I couldn't agree more about this need to have the conversation the other way around of incorporating the economy into nature, not the other way around. I think that was really, really important points to make. Um, I wanted to talk really about the um, really interesting point you made about the lack of convergence in ecosystem kind of earth models for marine ecosystems compared to terrestrial ones. And I think that might be quite a check because I mean, people often think that the, the land is more diverse in its ecosystems than the ocean. So why do you think terrestrial ec ecologists have got more convergence in their models than oceanic ecologists. Are they just overconfident? Are they naive about it? <laughs> uh, I certainly don't view terrestrial ecologists <laughs> as overconfident. Um, and um, having worked on, on things like the Mattingly model, you know, I think there are, there are um, kind of, there is a range of ideas and conceptions about uh, how terrestrial ecosystems are formed. I just think that marine ecology has always been very quantitative. And um, I think in part because of the demands of fisheries and managing fisheries and having to model fisheries and you can't observe these things so well, you have more quite limited data in some cases and you have to develop these models about how that's done. And then you ha almost have these two parallel groups, you have fishery scientists who come from that background and are all about managing resources. And then you have conservation biologists and ecologists who are coming from, from the other direction and thinking about the assembly of ecosystems. So I'm sure that's contributed to it, but I think it's, I think it's to do with the, just the, the long quantitative history and indeed modeling history of marine ecology. I mean, some of the trophodynamic models of, of food webs and, and mass balance equations have been around 30 years, you know, we have a, a quite a long history. Um, and these new models are coming out all the time, like in FishMIP, we had three more models join us for the CMIP6 projections, which I didn't show, but, but hopefully will be coming out soon. So um, I love it. I think, it's, I think it's really valuable when we still lack a consensus as to, we don't have fundamental equations of ecosystems in the same way, I think it's really helpful. So you think there, as there are more models, you actually get more diversity and less yeah. convergence in, yes, because I mean, you have those same conversations about traits, obviously, versus function versus yeah. species numbers. Yeah. Kind of really, it's really interesting. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks. No problem. Yeah. Thanks, John. Um, Derek, there's a qu couple of questions in the, in the chat, if you want to open those up or I can read them. Yeah. I can see those. So Ben, um, dynamic MPAs is a potential contributor to solutions. Well, okay. There's no, so my vision about what a dynamic MPA would be is that it would be something with the biodiversity focus of marine protected areas. So that would be its primary purpose. And ideally it would be no take, so no fishing, but it would be triggered by, for example, certain set of, of conditions. And you can think about what those might be that would enable it to be relocated. Now, and, and shifted, for example, to track the impacts of climate change. The, the issue with 
static MPAs or a potential issue with static marine protected areas. And this is something that um, some people like to really hammer on MPAs with as a, as a potential solution is that if the ecosystem that they're protecting moves out of the MPA, then have, have they failed? Well, I don't think they failed. They're still protecting something in there, but maybe we need to develop other tools to, um, to track ecosystems. And in the oceans, you can approximate this by layering other single sector measures like fishery closures, like oil and gas regulations. But there's no, certainly in Canada, there's no, I don't think anywhere, there's no kind of legislative equivalent of marine protected areas that would have a provision to be moved um, in response to climate change. So we have no tools, no policy tools specifically designed to respond to climate change and shifting ecosystems in the same way that we have MPAs, which were kind of put together at a time when maybe climate change wasn't as much on the radar. And should we think about that? The, the reality is that's probably not going to happen, or at least people are dead set against it. And there are, there are downsides, okay? There needs to be a discussion about pros and cons, but certainly we need more proactive tools of some kind to respond to climate change impacts on marine ecosystems. Uh, Ellie. Uh, ecosystem models. Is there an area in which data's lacking? I, I, I like that you're collecting seabird diet data. I, you know, I think uh, I think that's great. And and who cares about what's fashionable, right? I mean, I think um, that certainly shouldn't dictate research. In terms of um, food web information in the oceans, there's actually a slide I I took out at the last minute just because I was worried about time. But if we look at the biodiversity information in the ocean, we know quite a lot about what's going on in near shore shallow waters. The, the, our understanding of the global ocean drops off dramatically as we move into the open waters of the ocean. It drops off dramatically as we go below 200 meters. And we have this whole kind of mesopelagic communities between about 200 and 1,000 meters that are incredibly important maybe the largest migration of biomass in the earth, in, on earth as they move you know, uh, at nighttime up to, the, up to the surface of the ocean and come, come, come back down again for the day, we have these huge biomasses that we know very little about. So I think as we, as we go down in depth, um, we, we miss a lot of data. Um, but of course, there's a reason for that. It's because it's very expensive and very challenging to get. So that's, that's really the constraint. Um, Abby, so this is a question about areas beyond national jurisdiction, i.e. the high seas. Um, yeah, I think it's an absolutely unique um, environment, political environment for, for testing things like uh, dynamic marine protected areas. So essentially within exclusive economic zones out to about 200 nautical miles, a nation has jurisdiction over its own waters and its own tools for, for example, marine conservation there. Beyond 200 nautical miles, so a large chunk of the global ocean is labeled the common heritage of, of, of mankind or as it should be of humankind. Um, so I think, it's a, I think it's an amazing area and certainly that's been pitched as potentially a place where some of these new solutions could be explored because there's much less infrastructure, and this is true of the ocean in general, there's much less infrastructure to get in the way of more dynamic solutions relative to, to on land. The difference, the, or the difficulty of course, is, is getting people to, or getting nation states to agree to um, setting up some of these tools. But there've even been suggestions, for example, that we close the whole high seas to fishing and, and economic analyses that suggest that could be a, a net benefit. So I think it's a really, really strong um, opportunity. Yeah. Great, thanks everyone for those, um, for those questions in the chat. Richard, you have your hand up. Yeah, th th thanks Derek, that, that, that was an amazing, amazing uh, talk there. I, I was interested that the, the emerging sort of model of, of, uh, of the oceans had biomass as its ultimate kind of measure. And I wondered what you felt 
the fact that species identity and the persistence of species isn't captured by that that measure is that not a problem for us as conservationists or or is it not yeah good question good question richard i think um yes uh, yes of course i think i think looking at biomass gives you one slice through biodiversity which as we all know is a is a very complex multifaceted concept which is one of the one of the challenges that we face again i think this was primarily because biomass is if you like the one standard result that we can get from multiple marine ecosystem models i think if they all used species and if heaven forbid they all had the same species in then doing those comparisons would be incredibly important and we shouldn't forget them you're i mean you're, you're absolutely right i think as we have a broader array of species focused models that we can do these comparisons and we certainly shouldn't lose sight of individual species and of impacts on um, individual species and, and at risk species as examples like the North Atlantic right whale show. Okay, these are impacts on potentially very important or very threatened species. Um, so I totally agree that that deserves a focus. I think when we look at model comparisons we have to work with what's out there for now but hopefully that will change and and then we also need to think more about functioning and and the roles that individuals play as opposed to just pure biomass and i think as models get more sophisticated in terms of ecological functioning we can use that as another axis but i think we need all of these slices through biodiversity to really assemble a picture of what's going on yeah super talk derek super talk thank you, thank you. thanks richard I um, I've got another question. It's on the topic of biomass, Derek, so I'll, I'll quickly ask it now. Um, so you, you were suggesting that under a RCP 2.6 scenario that, you know, we could see around a 5% decline in, in ocean biomass. How does that play out in terms of, is that just for natural populations or how does it impact aquaculture, given that that's, you know, an increasing mm. portion of the biomass we're getting from the oceans? And and what are the kind of big take home messages from that in terms of, you know, the capacity of oceans to, to feed us as a society? Because obviously, you know, in terms of a lot of people having access to protein, that's a, a major source for, you know, millions and millions of people. And so what, what's the kind of the, what are the implications of those declines? I think the implications are something that, that we need to look at more because it's not yet clear to me how those biomass declines propagate through to both fisheries and to aquaculture. So in terms of wild capture fisheries, we, we, one of the problems that we have, again, comes back to scenarios in that the SSPs say almost nothing about human uses of the oceans. So we have to develop and we're in the process of developing um, scenarios to map to the SSPs of uh, fishing. But you need, you need quite a comp, not complex, but you need a bioeconomic model where fishing fleets redistribute based on, you know, the potential, the potential benefits. And then you look at how the impacts of um, fishing um, also interact with climate change. So I think it's still an open question about whether there'll be kind of a, a synergistic impacts on the underlying organisms and B, what the ultimate consequences are, because we can think of biomass essentially as the as the pool that supports all, all fisheries. In terms of aquaculture, that's not something we've looked at, but if indeed, and the empirical evidence suggests that this is the case, if indeed there is a change in the um, trophic transfer efficiency and metabolic costs, okay, you're, you're expending more energy to grow a unit of biomass, then obviously that will have consequences in terms of the amount of input that goes into aquaculture versus the amount of output that comes out. Um, if you, depending where you're doing this aquaculture, right? So you could be doing aquaculture in a, in a closed system where you have more fine control over, over temperature, but certainly this is something that is worthy of further exploration. Because it's the case, right, that a lot of the, the protein that goes into aquaculture actually comes from other fish populations, right? So. Yeah, some of the largest, um, fisheries in the world, um, for example, off Peru, a good chunk of that goes, uh, is ground up as fish meal and, and fed to other fish to, to turn into fish that we like to eat. Yeah, 
challenge. Are there any other questions from anyone? I can see a hand went up, just gonna find who that is. So John again. Yeah, just a quick question. I was, I've been puzzling over this really stark um, contrast between the biomass of primary producers mm -hmm. and consumers. And I, I guess the message I'm getting from that is that land plants are incredibly inefficient because they have to have lots of structures and biomass that's not photosynthetic, whereas phytoplankton can just float around and move where they need to be. Or it's that consumers are much more efficient because they can move. Locomotion is less, of, less um, of a problem, less thermal regulation. I don't know what your view would be about that, but that inversion to me is really fascinating. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? I think it's a really interesting question and I, I don't think we have good, it's obviously fundamental. I don't think we, I find it fascinating too. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I would, and I think I'd probably get in trouble if I called terrestrial plants in, uh, forests inefficient. <laughs> I, I mean, arguably they're quite efficient um, as, as carbon sequestration units, yeah. but of course you're absolutely right in that they have all these, these complex structures that are necessary um, to, to enable these smaller components which do the actual photosynthesis. So in that sense, yes, they're, they're more inefficient. They, uh, they don't need to just float along and, and kind of essentially have a, a large chunk of their surface available for photosynthesis. But there, there's lots of mysteries there, you know, in terms of like why there aren't kind of in general, there are exceptions to this, but why there aren't much larger floating photosynthesizers. Um, yeah, I, thought, I mean, I, I think a lot about land plants. So I'm not saying mm -hmm. land plants aren't efficient, but just, <laughs> yeah. you have to have trees that are big, right? And they have to of course, yeah. each other. So I don't know. I don't know much about what phytoplankton do. And as you say, why they're not more complex and why they haven't evolved more multicellularity apart from in shallower waters with kelp. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think, I think it's the competitive pressures are very different on land, aren't they? Because as you say, you, you have a canopy and, and you need to, you know, get your photosynthetic apparatus up above that canopy to, to survive. And there's strong competitive pressure. And those pressures are obviously different in the oceans and have led to this radically different um, configuration. But when you look at it on a, on a global level, you know, the oceans cover more of the earth, but still only contribute about half the MPP. So yeah. it's a, it's a real, it's a real uh, interesting question. Yeah, it's really interesting. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Um, so I can't see any other questions. And I, oh, actually, Louise, <laughs> go for it, please. And there's other questions in the chat. So yeah, this that. is fantastic. Keep the discussion going. Hi there. Um, thank you, Derek. Really fascinating talk. Um, my question's about um, what do you think about the future of marine biodiversity monitoring? Um, so I was just wondering what sort of technologies do you think might be most helpful for improving our knowledge mm -hmm. of marine species? And, and what do you think about um, balancing the amount of effort or resources that go into monitoring such a sort of vast and challenging realm um, versus just putting more effort into improving the modeling? Yeah, good, good question. I'll, I'll, very good question. I'll start with the first point. I think there's one technology that's going to be transformative. So until now, I think we've made significant advances, uh, particularly in terms of autonomous vehicles that can, that can move through the oceans and sample biological and uh, chemical characteristics by biological, I mean, you know, for example, um, productivity or chlorophyll, and can, you know, you can, you can attach uh, cameras and other sensors. But the thing that I think is going to be transformative is eDNA, because all of the, and it's really exciting, all of the um, examples that I've seen have shown that eDNA is incredibly effective at picking up parts of biodiversity that traditional trawl surveys, for example, don't get and, and, and picks up a much wider array of organisms. I'm not sure it will be able to answer every question, but I think if, particularly when it comes to a, a, a relative abundance, but I think, it, I think it offers an opportunity for cheap um, sampling of, of ecosystems at scale in the oceans. And uh, I'm really excited about it. And certainly, uh, in, you know, I've had discussions with colleagues here in terms of some of the marine protected areas where you can't go in and, 
and sample, you're, you're prohibited, for example, from doing any kind of destructive sampling, then eDNA may offer an opportunity to really help us identify the, what's going on inside those MPAs. In terms of effort into sampling versus modeling, I guess my feeling is that we always benefit from having more data. And I think that having things at scale like eDNA will be incredibly transformative. I think um, the flip side of that is that there's always more data out there and we can always do more with the data that we, that we have and we don't use all the data that we have and there's certainly more work we can do on the modeling. So I don't think I can give you a good answer to that. I think, yeah, I think we need both. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thanks, Louise. So sorry, uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat now. Yeah, sure. Uh, Jim, what's my favorite marine, marine organism? Um, I think it's the glass goby, I, I, because it's, it's a little goby that sits on, on coral reefs. I saw a lot of them when I was in um, Belize. It just sits there and it's very, it's not, um, it's not a kind of a, a charismatic megafauna, but it's almost transparent and you can see like its entire internal structure. And I just love it. I, I love kind of the, the organisms that just sit there doing their own thing. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe play an important role in an ecosystem, but are really undervalued. And I, I kind of think that those are the organisms that we, that we should focus on. Um, uh, do I eat fish? And if so, what kind? I do eat fish. I don't eat a lot of fish. Um, and it's like, um, it's something that I, I like fish, but I, I don't, it's not something that maybe I enjoy as much as other people. So in a sense, it's maybe easier for me to not eat a lot of fish. Um, in terms of its provenance, I think things like the, um, the, the little cards you can get in your wallet that <clears throat> look at individual fisheries and tell you whether, how sustainable it is and how, um, uh, how problematic the, the, the fish species and indeed the individual fish stock can be are, are really useful. And there's a bunch of different organizations out there that, that can help you with that. So look for some of those wallet cards that you can carry with you when you, when you go out. Um, I think that's really useful. And um, it's always good, I think, to support smaller artisanal fisheries, um, which may be where the future should lie rather than large scale industrialized fisheries. Um, I see Marina. Yeah, I, I mean, I have time for a, for a question. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. And uh, it's a bit of a broad. Uh, I really like the ending of your talk with the, the positive message of transformative change. And I guess also building up on Georgina May's uh, people in nature uh, ideas. But I personally have to say that I uh, was quite negatively surprised by how people were willing to change their, their lives now during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I just wanted to hear what, how did you feel about it? And how do you think after this year and seeing how much people really complained about uh, changing their lives? Uh, I don't know if that's the experience you all had, but at least that's how I felt. I, I, I felt a bit more, yeah, negative about it, being able to really, like the transformative changes is, is is possible. Yeah, I mean, I think there are different ways of looking at that. I think one is that it shows that <clears throat> societies can, if they prioritize things, they can radically reconfigure what's going on, right? We've seen huge closures, massive changes in, in how people work. Um, a lot of it is, is top down. So it was, it was in force, but it's because um, eventually, and not everywhere, but a lot of countries took COVID very seriously and proceeded to enact these changes that otherwise would have seemed outrageous. So it shows it can be done if we take things seriously. The question is, do we, do we take things seriously and do people take things seriously enough? Because there's no doubt in my mind that climate change will, will kill a lot more people, unfortunately. Um, 
that's you know and, and, uh, that's just the, the reality um so i think the problem is that it's unfolding over a longer time scale and a time scale that always seems a little bit in the future um so we we really need that um societal consensus that this is also a a problem that requires us to radically transform our societies and i think that comes from maybe the changes come from top down but the, the pressure comes from comes from the bottom up and i think we need to yeah. we all need to as, as i'm sure we are we all need to be conscious of that thank you <laughs> thanks marina and i think now we should um we should wrap up so Firstly, just to, to thank everyone um, for attending today um, and also all the, the great questions and, and really interesting discussion. Um, it's now that it kind of feels sad that we, we're not going to a wine reception because I'm sure um, it would have been great to, to have Derek and, you know, and keep, keep asking him questions and, and chatting to him. Um, and of course, to, to a massive thank you to, to Derek. I mean, it really was a, a wonderful talk. It was a great mix of fundamental theory, policy, thought experiment and humour. Um, and I know we all we all really appreciated it. Um, Thank you. In due course, the, the recording of the lecture will be uploaded to the to the um, CBA YouTube channel, um, where you can also find the lectures from from previous years. Um, and finally, just to say, we look forward to seeing you all hopefully in person. I'm sure in person um, for the next Ben Collin Memorial Lecture in 2022. So, thanks again, everyone, and, and take care. Thanks all. Bye bye. <laughs>